gonna try something new. So I have right here the script for Teen Wolf pilot episode, the first episode. And I know it's backwards, work with me. And you see uh, autographs from the cast. I know they're photocopied, that's fine. Uh, got this off Etsy, Etsy for a birthday present for me. And I'm going to read it. Pilot, Act 1. Fade in. External shop, Beacon Hills. Night. On the royal outskirts of a small California town called Beacon Hills, police officers and state troopers gather on a dirt road. At their side, search dogs bark and whine, pulling their leashes taut. One by one, the officers click on flashlights and then glance at the head officer for his signal. Finally, he gives a nod. Seconds later, a dozen streaks of light tear through the shadowy woods. A desperate search begins. McCall home, night. Not far from those dense woods, a two-story home lies hidden under a canopy of trees. A gentle wind drifts into the open window of an upstairs bedroom where two hands thread the laces of the head of a lacrosse stick. The work is fast and precise fingers pulling through lace into a diamond mesh pattern. Nodding the last loop, 16-year-old Scott McCall stands through the re-threaded stick. Dressed in only a pair of athletic shorts, the his length frame may still have some filling out to do, but it's easy to see that he'll soon grow into a strikingly handsome young man with deep black eyes designed to melt the hearts of a hope of hopeful young girls. Scooping the ball from his bedroom floor, he gives the lacrosse cross stick a spin, testing his handiwork. A moment later, the re-threaded stick lands next to a school book bag while Scott pumps up a few chin-ups at the bar mounted in the door frame of his closet. Then, toothbrush in his mouth, he reaches for the window seal to pull it down, but he stops. When he hears a sound, he cocks his head to he, he cocks his ear to listen again. Under whispering wind, he hears movement, a strange shuffling noise. McCall hallway. Hallway. Scott silently slips into the hallway and peers into another room. His mother. Melissa McCall, late thirties, before remarkably, both remarkably strong and remarkably beautiful, sleeping over the covers of the bed, fully clothed as if she had just passed out, having walked in. Scott eases her door closed shut. <clears throat> Outside, the glass door to the porch slides open. Now armed with a baseball bat, Scott starts from the yard. Beneath hell, breath held tight, he moves cautiously off the porch steps. The sound of movement stops in cold. Holding still, he peers left and right. As his white knuckles, as he white knuckles the bat ready to swing, when he sees, when his eyes wander up to the side of the house, he sees a dark figure climbing up the vine wrapped thistles. Before Scott even knows what's happening, the figure breaks free and comes hurtling towards him. Scott hollers in terror as the as an upside down face appears in front of him. He almost swings the bat before realizing who it is. Scott, Styles, what the hell are you doing? Styles, you weren't answering your phone. Feet caught in the thrustle, Styles hangs in front of Scott, a 16-year-old with boundless energy. He continues talking upside down as if this was perfectly normal way to have a conversation. Styles. I know it's late, but you gotta hear this. I saw my dad leave 20 minutes ago. Dispatch called. They're bringing in every officer from Beacon Hills Department and even state police. Scott, for what? Styles, two joggers found a body in the woods. Scott, a dead body? Styles, no, a body of water. Yes, dumbass, a dead body. Reaching out to pull himself free from the thirsts, he lands on his feet in front of Scott. Scott, you mean like murdered? Styles, no one knows yet. Just that it's a girl, probably in her 20s. Scott, hold on. If they found a body, what are they looking for now? Styles, that's the best part. They only found half. Beacon Hills Preserve. A beat-up jeep skids to a halt just before the heavily wooded entrance of the Beacon Hills Preserve. Styles gets out with his flashlight in hand. Scott follows, hurryingly to keep with him as he charges into the hiking path. Scott, are you are we serious? Are we seriously doing this? Styles. You're the one who's always bitching that nothing happens in this town. Besides, it's our only last night of summer freedom. Scott, I was trying to get a good night's sleep from tomorrow's practice. Styles, right. 
because sitting on the bench is such a grueling effort. Scott, no, because I'm playing this year. In fact, I'm going to make starting lineup. Styles, that's the spirit. Everyone should have a dream, even a pathetically unrealistic one. Scott, just one of just out of curiosity, which half of the body are we looking for? Styles, huh? I don't even think about that. Scott, and what if whosoever killed the girl is still out here? Styles, also something I don't think about. Scott, comforting to you know you planned this out with your usual attention to detail. Reach, racing, racing up the path, Scott's breath begins to shorten. Scott, maybe the severe asthmatic should be the one holding the, the flashlight. Style slows, but not because of Scott. Outside, the clear and yellow police tape marks off the perimeter using floodlights. Grinning Styles looks to Scott, who can't help but smile back. Crouching low, they circle the crime scene looking for the best vantage point. But they freeze at the sound of a zipper being pulled up on a body bag. Two bare feet are momentarily visible up the zipper pulls close. The officers lift the body bag up onto the medical examiner's van. Scott, is that the second half of the body? Styles, no, they would have called off the search and cut and they would have called off the search. Come on. He and Scott retreat from the perimeter back into the dark woods as they crest as they crest as they crest the hill. Styles pauses below flashlight beams scour the shadows. The police search just ahead. Unable to stand still, Scott races forward. Scott Styles races forward. Scott Styles, wait up! But quickly running out of air, Scott pulls out his inhaler from his jacket. While he pauses to take a hit from it, Styles disappears up ahead. Then realize, realizing he's left ba Scott behind, he slows to look back when Bark spins him around. Fang teeth snap viciously at him, sending him staggering away and falling right onto his ass. Search dogs yank back against their leashes just before tearing him apart. State, pr state trooper, stay right there. Scott freezes. It's not for him. It's not him the state trooper was yelling at. However, peering from behind a tree, he sees Dials was right Run right into the search party. Flashlights beam in his eyes. The boy puts his hands up in the air as large. Threatening figures hurry forward. Deputy Selimsky. Off screen. Hold on, Horlong. This little delinquent belongs to me. Deputy, Deputy Sheriff steps into the light past the growling search, uh, search dogs. Styles shrinks under his glare. Deputy, St Deputy Selimsky. Do you, do you listen in to all my phone calls, Styles? No, not the boring ones, Deputy Slinsky. And where is your usual partner in crime? Where is your usual partner in crime, Styles? Who? Scott? Scott's home. Said he wanted to get a good night's sleep for the first day back at school. Deputy Slinsky calling out. Scott, you out there? Hit in the shower. Scott doesn't move. Deputy, Deputy Stalinsky, clearly suspicious. All right, young man, I'm taking you back to your car, and we're going to discuss the little something called invasion of privacy. Watching Styles get escorted away, Scott steps from the cover of the trees where he were an with an irritated sigh. Starting back, he tries to find his way out of the woods, but with each step becomes increasingly difficult to see in the pitch black. At a fork in the path, he pauses in confusion. He's about to start off down one direction when he hears a rustling among the trees. Scott holds still, breathing tightly more out of fear than asthma. He reaches in the pocket for his inhaler when he hears an odd rumbling. The sound of a sudden furious movement rising in volume and velocity until, until half a dozen deer charge out of darkness, soaring past him with thunderous beat of hooves trampling the ground. Startled, Scott drops the inhaler. Then once again, alone in the dark, he kneels down to the leaf-covered ground to search for it. Pulling out his cell phone as a light to display, guiding the phone's light over the ground, Scott doesn't find his inhaler, but he manages, but does manage to briefly illuminate a face. Dead eyes peer from the pale yet beautiful face of a young woman who is torn in half. Crying in shock, Scott lunches up, tripping on a, over his own feet and trembling over an unearthed roots of a tree. Suddenly, he's propelled down a leaf-covered slope, rolling head over heels right into a creek bed. Pushing himself from the icy water, a breathless Scott looks up at the embankment down which he just fell. He's about to stand when a low growl step stops him from moving, stops him from breathing. Something crouches in the shadows right near him. 
something very large. Scott suddenly begins to turn around when a shape hurtles towards him. For the briefest instant through the flash of light of razor sharp teeth, Scott twists forward crying out, then seemingly to disentangle himself from the animal's attack, he scrambles back to his feet and into a panic run. Whipping through branches and tearing at his skin and clothes, he races blindly through the forest until he reaches a barbed wild fence. When a barely a second of coordinated effort, Scott lowers himself over the uh, over the barbed wire, start catching and tearing across the burrows. Crashing out of the woods and into the road, car, uh, Scott whirls around a face of an oncoming car. The driver swerves, almost clipping him, horn burling, and the car hurtle, hurtles past. Breathless, Scott breaks away from the woods. With the world spinning around him, dark blood streaks down his tethered his tethered shirt to the back over, a deep, ambitious-looking bite. Struggling to crawl calm, he whips around when he hears the stranger sound, a wolf howling. It echoes through the hall, hills, over the trees, across the rooftops, and into the night. Fade out. End of Act 1. And you know what? I'm just going to do Act 1. And I will do Act 2 some other time. So, hope you guys like that. Like I said, I'm going to continue to do so. Um, I just thought of it now. So that's act one. So I will do act two some other time and uh, we'll go from there.